it's Maggie here again to talk about caddisflies tonight. So um, we've talked about the last two weeks, stoneflies and mayflies, and caddisflies kind of wrap up our three you know, big groups of aquatic insects that we talk about when we are talking about flies and fly fishing. And so caddis are a little bit different than the other groups. And in a way, it's like they're more complicated, but they're more simple at the same time. So there's more complicated parts of their life cycle and their biology and life history, but it's a simpler approach as an angler, if that makes sense. Um, and we tend to look at stoneflies more as a time of year and size thing. We look at mayflies as kind of a type of water and size thing. And then we look at caddisflies more, is a, it's more of a behavior thing that we look at when we're trying to imitate them when we're fishing. So I'm gonna start with a little presentation here. Make sure you guys can see my screen. Everybody good there? All right, so caddisflies are in order Trichoptera. So remember we went through kingdom Phylum, um, class, order, family, genus, species last week, and caddisflies are in kingdom Animalia, phylum, insecta, or excuse me, phylum, arthropoda, class, insecta, and then they're in order Trichoptera here. Trichoptera actually means hair wing, um, and so what makes caddisflies unique is their closest relative is butterflies and moths. So they're gonna have life cycles similar to butterflies and moths, and then the adult caddisflies kind of look a lot like a little brown moth or a small butterfly of sorts. Um, but I did a little research and I found this was pretty interesting. Like, where does the word caddis come from? And caddis doesn't really have a full on like derivative, like a Latin derivative there, like Trichoptera does. Um, caddis is actually a term that they believe from like, ancient like 1600 like way 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 before um like jesus times they were having merchants in marketplaces that wanted to display their different types of cloth that they sold and they would take little cuttings of these cloths and they didn't have billboards and things back then so they would pin it to the outside of their um robes and so their robes would be kind of like checkerboards of all these different colors and materials and so that's where the word caddis came from and so caddis have evolved over time. Um, like I said, their most close relatives are butterflies and moths. And so they've evolved this way to spin cases. And they can do this because they have these little silk spinneret glands right in their mouths. Um, and the silk allows them to build these cases. It allows them to build nets. It allows them to suspend themselves in the water. Um, but it, it allows them to do all sorts of things that other um, aquatic insects cannot do. So larvae, as with all insects, are going to have six legs and they all have really hooked claws. So we talked about um, stoneflies and mayflies and how stoneflies have two tarsal claws at the end of each foot and mayflies have one tarsal claw at the end of each foot. And then the caddisflies are all going to have really hooked claws. So you're going to really notice right away that they have hooked claws when you see the larva. Um, when we talk about the adults, remember the easy way to tell the adults apart is stoneflies' wings are flat over each other's back. Mayflies are going to be like a sailboat upright on the water. And then caddisflies are going to be like a tent. And so like I was saying, there's simple parts about this and more complicated parts about caddisflies. But one of the simple parts is they all look really, really similar as adults. They even challenge the most... Um, detailed entomologists to identify some of the adult species because they all tend to look small and brown and gray, so don't overthink yourself here. Um, so many of these larvae um, are gonna build protective cases from organic matter, pebbles, and twigs and things. Um, sometimes even bigger species will build uh, protective cases out of smaller species. So you'll have like this whole conglomerate of different caddisflies and different species all living in one giant shelter on each other. Um, some are actually free living and they believe that those maybe haven't evolved as much. Um, so they believe that our free living caddisflies are the ones that all caddisflies kind of originate from. They, they develop this silk spinneret gland and then over time they develop the ability 
to spin nets to catch their food or to protect themselves. And then they started picking up things like rocks and twigs and sticks and building cases. And over time, as these larvae grow, instead of having to find a new case every time, what it's allowed them to do evolutionarily is build more on each case. So like as they get bigger, they just keep adding to their case. So it's almost like a turtle shell, um, but they can keep building on to it. Um, some of these species are going to be filter feeders. Some are going to be predatory. Um, some are going to be more plant-based. So it's just like with mayflies and stoneflies, kind of all over the place, what, um, what the different species do and how they feed. And caddisflies have pretty consistent emergence all summer and fall. Um, sometimes we see a few in the middle of winter. Um, it's believed that some caddisflies will overwinter and hibernate. They do have the ability to feed unlike their mayfly counterparts that do not have working mouth parts. They do have kind of a proboscis type structure that allows them to sip liquids and feed on nectar. So they can live for months at a time as opposed to the stoneflies and mayflies who are living you know, days to weeks at a time. So a little bit longer lifespan here too. So these guys as opposed to mayflies and stoneflies are going to go through complete metamorphosis. So um, what that looks like for an aquatic insect is the eggs are going to be laid, and we'll talk, get into that a little bit more later on, but the eggs are laid somewhere near the water, in the water, and then that larva hatches out. And why are we calling this a larva rather than a nymph? When we talk about fishing, it's always a nymph if it's something that we're fishing with underwater. So nymph is kind of a catch-all term. It can mean any type of immature insect. But when we specify and say larva, that means it has some worm-like characteristics. So caterpillars are larva, um, immature caddisflies are larva, anything with where they have kind of the six legs focused at the front of their body and they have kind of a wormy back end, we're going to call that a larva, and the fact that it goes through complete metamorphosis. So um, another example of that would be like a beetle grub, that's a larva. Um, so those larvae are going to go through those instars, just like we talked about with the other groups. So they're going to shed that exoskeleton multiple times from four to possibly 40 different times as a larva. And then they're going to form a pupa. And so the unique part about caddis is we talked about how they have cases, right? They don't all have cases, but a lot of them do have cases. And so they've already got this little rock structure. So they've basically got a fort built around where they're going to pupate. So they've got this case around them and then they pupate inside that case. Then that pupa, when it's ready to emerge, is gonna do a couple different things. Um, it becomes active as a pupa. Most of the time a pupa is kind of a dormant stage, but caddis are unique that they have a stage called the ferrate adult stage, which means it's active as a pupa because it's trying to come to the surface to emerge as an adult. It's not just started this stage. Um, when larvae first form their pupa around their body, it's a hardening of their exoskeleton that happens. And I like to think of it, it's not like wings sprout and this thing emerges. Like literally their cells scramble and rebuild a whole new animal. It's one of mother nature's like greatest mysteries. Um, so while that's all happening, um, then the eventual adult forms, but it's still trapped inside this exoskeleton, right? This last casing, and it's got to burst out of that to become an adult. So this ferrate pupa, so to speak, will swim to the surface. Um, it can use uh, oxygen bubbles trapped inside of the, the caddis case to help it get to the surface. It can chew through part of its, um, part of its pupa and the casing and swim out as an adult already so when caddis come to the surface like they're ready to go this isn't like mayflies coming out daintily to the surface and pumping their wings full of blood or a stone fly crawling up on some substrate on the shore and you know taking off on on its flight this is like the caddis hits the water surface and it's just like pew, it's ready to go so it could be a winged adult when it gets to the surface in theory, and it can fly away immediately. So a little bit different process there, but that also affords us some different opportunities for fishing. Um, once that pupa emerges as the winged adult, obviously the cycle starts over, the winged adults mate, lay eggs, and they die. 
so we do caddis or we do classify caddisflies in um, ecological standards like we do mayflies and stoneflies. But one of the bigger ways that we identify caddis is based on their case or lack thereof. Um, their movement groups are pretty negligible. I mean, they're pretty, pretty much all just trying to hold on for dear life. They've got this big old turtle shell like thing on their back and it's really heavy and cumbersome, especially if water levels get low. So they've evolved kind of flat and front, front portions of their body or almost little spidery looking legs that help them cling onto rocks and things. Um, and then you've got sprawlers, which are going to be caddis that live not so much on rocks and things, more on like sandy or silty or muddy kind of bottoms, where they kind of walk around more in like a crab-like fashion. So like I was saying, they feed in all different forms. Um, they can filter. So filter feeders, like what is behind me, um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but if you can see the net, the meshy looking net behind me, um, that's actually a net built by Hydrocycidae caddis, which he is using for filter feeding purposes. So just like a spider or something, some of these free living caddis will spin nets underneath the water between little pebbles and things, and they'll use it to catch things that come flying by in the current. Um, so filter in theory could also be carnivorous. So if you know a little mayfly comes flying by and it gets caught in the net, he could chop down on that. So filter feeder does not mean that it's not um, uh, predatory as well. They can gather things, so they gather and collect food and store it, or they'll eat it immediately. They scrape things off of rocks and plants. Um, they shred things like fall leaves in the in the river system, shredded it into detritus. Um, or they can be predators that hunt other invertebrates. And you know, I I do a lot of sampling, and when I get certain species of free-living caddis, I'll separate them immediately because otherwise I'll have other um, animals start to die because of them being alive in the tank. So they'll start to take out other bugs. They're pretty predatory. Um, so for identifying caddis, they're going to look pretty similar to a caterpillar, like I mentioned. Um, they are housed either in or not in a protective case. So um, a lot of times I'll look at their heads too. Their heads tend to be a caramel color. And then sometimes they'll have two or three um, plates right on their back that you can see before you start that kind of creamy white grubby looking body. Um, a lot of times too, when you catch a, a live caddis fly in, in the water versus something that you see in a book or that's been pickled for a while, you're going to see like in this color right behind me, it's really lime green. So a lot of caddis patterns that you see are going to be really vibrant lime green colors. Um, and that's a more accurate indicator of what they're feeding on underwater and what color their body is. I mean, it's just like a penguin and, or penguin, <laughs> a flamingo, um, and what they feed on and what makes them turn pink, you know, anytime that they're feeding on these algaes, they're turning this green color um, from all of the chlorophyll. So they've got six legs near their head, like I mentioned, and then they have this little set at the rear end called anal pro legs. Um, same exact thing in caterpillars. Like if you've ever looked at a caterpillar up close, he's got six kind of like hard little legs up front and then they have all these suction cup things all the way down. Those aren't real legs, those are what's called pro legs and then they'll have two right at the very end um, and caddis always just have two of these little suction cuppy looking pro legs right at the very end and sometimes they'll have little tufts of gills. Um, like we talked about with stoneflies, we identify them a lot by gills in their thorax portion of their body, under their arms, on their chest. Um, mayflies, we identify more about the gills that are on their abdominal portion of their body. And then for caddisflies, we look particularly for anal gills or really um, kind of feathery filamentous gills that go down their abdomen as well. Um, like I was saying, we don't get too much in the weeds even as entomologists with caddisflies. They are very, very difficult to key out. And a lot of times the things that make them separate, separate as species are things that a fish can't even see. So it's like whether or not they have these three bumps on their abdomen after you pull them out of their case. Um, one question I get a lot too is like, do fish even care about them because they're in a case? 
Um, yeah, they do. When you pump a fish's stomach, a lot of times you'll find caddis cases. So these caddis are curious too, and they're coming out to feed and they'll poke their little heads out and they'll see that little flash of color and the fish will eat the whole thing anyway, knowing that the protein is inside of it. Um, but that's um, something that we'll talk about a little bit more when we get into the flies and stuff. Um, for the adults, like I mentioned, the wings are going to be held like an A-frame or tent-like over the body. They're going to look similar to a small moth, and they're going to have light hair on their wings. So again, back to that being relatives with butterflies and moths. Butterflies and moths, if you ever touched one up close, you touch a butterfly or a moth and you get this powdery stuff that comes off on your hand. Those are called scales. For uh, caddisflies, you're going to have these light hairs that hold their color and structure. So they don't have that kind of wipe away scaly feeling to their wings. Um, that's how one way that I know for sure it's a caddisfly is I'll kind of hold it up and look close. And if you can see like fine little filamentous hairs coming off of it, you know that it's a caddis and not a moth. Um, um, smaller species are usually found in really big groups. So a lot like the mayflies, you'll find, um, you know, gen genetic strategy and hatching in really, really large numbers. Um, one of the more famous caddisfly hatches is the Mother's Day caddisfly hatch. Always happens kind of around Mother's Day. So coming up in the next month or so, we should start seeing these guys. Um, but one thing that always cracks me up is you may not see a caddis hatch, but if you've got a fishing net with you, you'll whack a bush around you in the summertime and the amount of caddis that'll come flying out of bushes will amaze you um, because they're one of the most common species on the river consistently throughout the summer, but they're probably one of the less cool bugs to fish, so to speak. You know, everybody is really after specific stonefly, mayfly hatches, and caddis are kind of like the redheaded stepchild of, of it all, but a lot of times when you throw on a caddis in the middle of some of those other hatches, you can have really good luck. So this was made by my buddy that I've mentioned before, Larry Solomon. He's like a world caddis expert. Um, but again, we don't, we don't get too much into the like three tails and brown color and gray color like we do with the mayflies here. We're looking more at kind of a wing shape. This is purely for identification purposes because if you think about it, the wing shape is over the water, right? So if these guys are kind of floating on top of the water, the fish are not like keying into specifics on how the wing is shaped. So this is purely for identification purposes. Um, but if you can see there in each one of the silhouettes, there's kind of like a small, medium, and large of each one. So once you know some basic characteristics of each family, you can kind of figure out what they are by their size specifically. And then one thing I didn't mention too is caddis are also unique in that they live everywhere. Um, when we talk about stoneflies, we're talking about highly oxygenated water. When we talk about mayflies, we're talking about really pure, clean, highly oxygenated water, um, some lake settings. But then when we talk about caddis, there are a lot of species that thrive in lakes, a lot of, that thrive in moving bodies of water, small streams, big streams, you name it. So caddis do have a little bit more of reach as far as um, where they can live and how they can live. So this is how my buddy Larry has them all classified. Um, it's more based on their ovipositing characteristics. And so ovipositing is just a fancy word for laying your eggs or depositing of the eggs. Um, and so there's a couple of families here at the top that lay their eggs by entering the water and laying strings of eggs on the bottom and then reemerging. So when caddis lay eggs, they lay these gelatinous masses that have all the little eggs suspended in them. And so what some of these families will actually do is these caddis fly adult females will mate and then they will sit on the bank and then they'll take a nose dive down. They'll find something on the bottom, very specific, where they want to lay their eggs. They'll lay their eggs and then they'll swim back up. And so that's one of the most underappreciated and underfished life forms of insects that's happening all summer long is this downwinged caddis. Um, and you can look up specific downwing caddis patterns. A lot of times they'll have like a little bit of turkey feather or CDC, um, but you know, they're not super weighted, but it's, it's to imitate a caddis like it's swimming down as opposed to swimming up. A lot of people get stuck on the pupa and the emergence and all that, and they leave out this whole ovipositing um, behavior that 
that is happening with a big portion of Caddis families. It's not just a couple of families that are doing this. This is a lot of family of Caddis that are doing this. Um, so again, that gives you some other forms that you can fish um, for Caddis. And that also brings me to something we'll talk about more in a minute, but soft tackles. So if you've ever fished a soft tackle, start thinking about the ways that you fish that and how unweighted it is the specific bug that that's imitating is a caddis, and that's a caddis either coming up to emerge, going back down to lay its eggs, um, but soft tackles are very specifically um, imitate caddis flies. So another um, ovipositing behavior is that they can dip their abdomens into the water or enter the water and release a large egg mass. Um, when you see stoneflies, lay eggs, they've got big black masses that they'll kind of bob and drop over the water. Um, mayflies kind of do the same thing. It's a little bit of a bobbing behavior. And um, this is kind of a similar type of egg laying behavior to those two groups. Um, they can deposit egg masses in the water on a damp area nearby or above water and on stones or vegetation. And so you read that and you're like, why the heck if you're an aquatic insect and your immature stages are in the water, why would you go lay your eggs on a, you know, cattail three feet away from shore? That would make no sense, right? But a lot of these bugs are hatching in late summer and specifically that last family there, Limnophility, it hatches in the late fall. And so what's happening to the water at that time of year? We're at our lowest water levels, right? So this is all pre-runoff. So it's all kind of a planned life cycle um, for these eggs to get swept back down during runoff and then they go out of this dormant phase and start developing again. So every insect has a way of dealing with winter, whether or not it, you know, converts sugars into glycols and it doesn't freeze or it hibernates or it just lets its body go into a diapause of sorts, which is kind of mother nature's, you know, hibernation cryogenics. Um, but they all have different life forms that they go through winter in. And so this is just one of the ways that this particular family of caddisflies deals with that is that they'll, they lay their eggs at the end of the summer, maybe on a side of a bridge, and then they dry out. And then over the course of the spring and runoff and water, they're gonna get rushed down into the river beneath them. And then they're eventually gonna start developing again, which is a pretty crazy thing that that's part of like their whole life plan. And now we'll dive right into some of the families. I'm not going to get, like I said, too detailed with a lot of these, and I certainly am not covering them all. Um, I'm not covering a lot of the ones that are very similar in size, especially in like case sizing, um, but there are a whole lot of books and resources out there if you want to learn more about them, and I'll definitely include those at the end, and I'll give them all <clears throat> to Marsha to give out to you guys as well. Um, but the first major family is Brachycentridae, and Brachycentridae is um, commonly known as your Mother's Day caddis, your granums, or your apple caddis. Um, they're called granums over in the UK, and then they're really popular on the East Coast to fish. And then, I mean, they're just everywhere. And if you see these guys hatching, it happens in copious numbers. So they're little bitty. Um, so we just get blankets and blankets and blankets of them. They're probably the most common caddis that you see when you flip a rock over. And you see little really square cases. You ever see the super square ones and they're little bitty and there's tons and tons of them? That's a brachycentridae. Um, they can also make teeny tiny tubular cases as well. It doesn't have to be that square, but like I said, there's usually abundant numbers when you see them. It's not just one of them. Um, they cling on kind of for dear life. And if you look, they kind of make a T right out the top of their case. So um, that's another easy way to identify the nymph, or excuse me, the larval form is it kind of makes a T coming out the top of its case. So they have one generation per year, but there's longer lifespans, right, with the adults. So you're gonna have a much more staggered emergence and probably even higher numbers. So like I said, they're not, maybe as uh, important in angling to some people as a mayfly or a stonefly, but they're probably a more consistent thing in angling because they're gonna be hatching for longer periods of time, living for longer periods of time. Um, these guys aren't really predatory. They filter, gather, and shred. 
And then they have a really lime green body when they're inside that case. So if you've ever gone to a fly shop, um, you know how we've talked about attractor patterns versus match the hatch. So the tractor is a more flashy, get, grab your attention pattern, match the hatch is meant to look specifically like that bug. Um, so an attractor pattern is a pheasant tail. That could be mayfly, that could be a stonefly, that could be, that could be any kind of bug. Um, but sometimes they'll go and put little colors around the neck, like right behind the beads. And so anytime you see that like bright green or that pop of color, like a bright yellow behind the bead, that could be a great imitation for a caddis. So it's like the caddis popping out of its little case there because it's got more of a brown body. And like I said, the fish are not going to be super particular about the fact that it has a case on it because they know that there's protein inside of it. Um, family Glossosomatidae is another really common one that you see when you flip over rocks. If you've ever flipped over a rock and you see these little, looks like little Karens almost, or little piles of pebbles, and there's a million of them making little tiny pebble huts on the bottom of a bigger rock, that's a Glossosomatidae. So when I was telling you kind of the evolutionary portion of this, um, you go from the free-living caddis to caddis that have the ability to spin nets to caddis that have the ability to, spin, to build cases. So this is what they believe to be the first case builder. Um, it's a very primitive case. So it, it is very much like a turtle shell. Um, it, the case doesn't go all the way around them. It's really just kind of a dome over their body and it kind of glues them to a rock. So if you do flip them over, and you leave that rock flipped, those are all gonna die. They have no, like once they're out of the water, the weight of that dome over them on that little bitty caddis fly, he's not gonna be able to move that structure and get back underneath. Like a lot of other insects that would just scurry back around to the other side. So it's thought that these guys were the very first of the case builders, so they're not um, super nimble, so to speak. Um, when they emerge out as adults, they have a more mottled wing. So again, very, very limited differences in some of these species, but when they do have some spots to the wing, that is one of the identifying characteristics. Um, they cling on for dear life and they only really have the ability to scrape the rock they're stuck to. You have multiple generations per year. So this is a pretty common um, bug that we see throughout the summer on Rocky Mountain rivers. And pretty much all of the larvae inside their case are gonna look the same, that caramel colored head and a creamy colored body, um, green if they've been feeding on large amounts of chlorophyll. Hydrocycidae is the family that's in the picture behind me here. Um, I did that as my green screen so you could see that net up close because you can't see it really well in this photo here. But hydrocycidae is a free living net spinning caddis. So it can, move from place to place. Um, it is predatory. It builds that little meshy looking net and it catches lots of little critters and things in there. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier in regards to the silk spinning abilities is um, we've talked about the drift and how you're not imitating these insects like as they are under a rock, right? Because the fish isn't flipping over rocks and picking these bugs off one at a time. He's catching these in in the water column as they're drifting, searching for food, looking to emerge, what have you. So caddisflies provide a lot more opportunities in the drift with the way they emerge and with the way they dive back down to lay eggs. Um, but they can also shoot little silk out of their mouth and then they just dangle in the water column. So it's almost like this little like repelling device that they use to kind of see where they want to go. They can change their depth, they can come back up, you know, so it's a really interesting um, evolutionary feature that they have. So that's what these hydrocycidae do quite a bit to move from place to place is they'll just shoot out a little bit of silk and just like a floating spider, you know, like the little babies on Charlotte's Web, they'll just go floating down the river and find a new place to live. Um, we do have one generation of these per year and same exact thing as the other guys, you'll have a kind of creamy white to lime green body and that caramel colored head. These guys are dead giveaway when you see them um, because they have two really big tufts of gills at their anal pro legs. So they're gonna have those two little legs coming off their rear ends and then they're gonna have two little furry things right there with them. Um, but they are the most common um, free living caddis that we see in the Rockies and that we'll collect. 
the other um, predatory one that we see that doesn't spin the net, that is just free living, um, doesn't necessarily have that curvature to its body. So this one makes a C a lot of the time, like that grub looking larval C shape. Um, and then the other species that we'll talk about kind of stays pretty flat. Limnophilids, um, family Limnophilidae. This is one of my favorite groups. Um, it's a very large caddis. So again, a lot of uh, size disparity in these guys. Um, you'll have little uh, Mother's Day caddis that hatch in abundant numbers that are just a couple centimeters long. And then these guys get all the way up to 33 millimeters, so like an inch and a half or so. So pretty big size difference there um, in these bugs. But in family limnophility, you'll have your October caddis, which there's, you know, a handful of actual common names that anglers know with these larger groups um, of insects. So people will know what the salmon fly is and they'll know what a PMD is. Um, October caddis and Mother's Day caddis seem to be the two caddis that everybody know what they are. Um, October caddis, as the name would suggest, is a large fall species. It has kind of a pumpkiny orange color to its body and legs and kind of a gray to black looking wing. Um, it's very closely related to the one that you see in the photo there in the adult that's that straw color. But the one in the photo there is a snow sedge. So that's one that we have that emerges in the winter time. And then we have one that's very similar as well. Um, called the silver mark sedge that hatches more in the fall. So again, big size. So what does that mean when you see a big caddisfly? It means there's not a big hatch. Um, a big caddisfly is usually very solitary. Um, they're not, you're not going to see these in big numbers. This is not some hatch you got to run to the river for, but I will tell you from experience, it can be a really productive pattern to use, um, you know, especially in the fall when fish have been seeing every mayfly, stonefly, grasshopper, they're just tired of seeing things over and over again that they've already seen and then you throw an October caddis their way, um, they're usually pretty enticed because that's their last really big meal of the year before they go into kind of some dormant stages as well with winter flows. Um, they typically have, like I was saying, we identify these uh, larvae by like bumps underneath the case. So if you can see that middle photo there, he's got kind of a big hump right behind his last little pair of legs on his back there. Um, so that's like an identifying feature. So again, you don't want to get too in the weeds with that. We get one big hatch of these per year, but like I said, there's multiple species of these. Um, they are shredders and gatherers, so not predatory at all, even though they're pretty big size. Um, and then, like I was saying earlier, there are some species that we believe to hibernate. And this is one that's also believed, like, you know, if you've got a wood pile outside your house or something like that, you might um, see some of these guys crawling out this time of year. It might be ones from fall that have hibernated a little bit. It might be newer emergences of the snow sedge from earlier this spring. So this is the other free living caddis that I was talking about. Um, I love this photo because I was able to get a picture of a live one and you can actually see how green these darn things are. Um, but this is family Rhyacophilidae or Rhyacophila, um, as some people will call it, or the green rock worm. So if you ever see that term in a fly shop, um, a fly named that green rock worm, that's the family that they're referring to. So this is what they believe to be the OG caddis species that all other caddis um, originated from. So as you can see on this guy, he's got some little gills on his abdomen. So over time, a lot of that stuff has faded out. Um, if you look at the adult picture there, that adult is almost identical to that Mother's Day caddis or the Granum caddis. So again, don't, you know, size 14 gray elk hair caddis, you're covered. It's not super, super complicated when it comes to fishing the adults. Um, we're not worried about matching up tails and colors as much. It's more of a size game and a how to fish it than anything. Um, they have that gr glowing green color as a larva, and then they don't have any of those little brown thoracic plates on their back, like I was saying. Some of them you'll see 
little brown plates on their back. But again, this is the one that they believe a lot of them to have originated from. So evolutionarily speaking, it has changed a lot since this little guy. Um, they are never going to have a case. They are going to cling or sprawl, depends on what kind of substrate you find them in. I found these guys in pretty much every body of water I've sampled um, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. But like I was saying, they're very predatory. So if I get one of these in a tank with little mayflies or something, I immediately remove him because he's going to eat them. Um, and then they come out pretty much all summer long. So that is my little overview of kind of what I believe to be our more important families of caddisflies. And now I'm going to do my best to show you guys um, some real specimens here and some flies. I'm getting better at this every week. So... These guys all here, these are all free living. These are all the net spinning caddis. And like I was saying, they kind of make that larval C shape. Um, of course, I'm out of isopropyl alcohol and with the coronavirus going on, you can't buy it anywhere. So I have a cheap vodka that all my bugs are in now. I look like an alcoholic. There's a bottle of like Stoli on my counter right now that I've gone through um, the last couple days getting a bunch of bugs put together. But um, these guys are all um, net spinning caddis and like you can see there's some itty bitty ones at the bottom of the screen and then there's some kind of medium size and then if I were to collect these you know two months from now they'd be even bigger so there's just a couple different instar versions here. Um, I also got these yesterday and again I apologize about the lights it kind of sucks. Um, but uh, this is a bigger species of caddis here and he, these look like wood chips almost. And a lot of times I wouldn't even collect things. Um, I would just think it's detritus or something at the bottom of the river. And then you take it out of the water for a second and something crawls out of it because he's struggling to breathe. And so I usually will take things from my seine nut and I'll leave it in the air for a minute or two because I want to see if some of these caddis crawl out of things that I think were possibly, you know, just junk at the bottom of the river and they're actually caddis cases. So just to kind of show you some differences there. Um, and some larvae. These are some adults that I got from right behind my house in the last couple of days. So like I was saying, those ones that hibernate and maybe live in your wood pile in the wintertime. Let's see which one I'm messing with. Um, but this is an example of one of those. And so that's a really big, I mean, that's like a size like 10 or 12 fly. So um, caddis can be really, really large. There's also some lake dwelling species that get this large, but there's, there's really only three or four species that get this big. And it's your October caddis, your lake dwelling species, and then these fall silver mark sedges. So once you kind of get familiar with the timing of the year that you're seeing them too, you can kind of peg down what specific one it is because I wouldn't necessarily know what particular limnophilid caddis this is if I didn't know what time of year it emerged. Um, that's more of the giveaway for me than anything. So like I said, I'm gonna just kind of run through some of these here. There's some more hydrocycity. So these are more of the free living, but a couple different sizes. And you can really see on that one in the middle there, um, the two anal prolegs. And it's kind of fuzzy, but those are the gills coming off the ends of them. And then he's got those dark plates on his back there. Those are those thoracic plates that I was talking about. So here, uh, this one's hilarious to me because I legitimately thought that was a wood chip. And then this little guy popped out. So you can kind of see there. There's some more of our fall caddis species. Maybe that's a little better. Um, that little case there is made out of lots of rocks and pebbles. 
So lots of different structure. You know, if I was in a lake setting, I might expect to find more weeds and reeds and things. Um, let's see that. It's so the camera is opposite of what you would think. So I'm like having to think counterintuitively. Um, there's a brachycentridae there, that uh, Mother's Day caddis. So kind of coming out of his case there, making that T shape with the angry arms popping out. But again, not always in a perfect square case. Um, you'll see these little tube shaped cases as well. Um, so the tube shaped ones and the square ones are the ones, like I said, you'll see copious amounts of them on rocks when you flip them over. And I also just recently learned too, they're um, detrimental when you have black flies around too, because these little caddis have stronger arms than black flies and black flies whole strategy is they're shaped like a bowling pin and so they'll like suction cup themselves to the back of rocks and then they kind of sway in the current and get their oxygen and food and these uh, caddis apparently just like walk up and like dislodge the black flies and they steal their spots so um, usually when you see a lot of these uh, you won't necessarily see black flies so there is a mother's day caddis adult um, so that's a species of brachycentridae, and then that tray next to them, that's a granum adult. So again, like so similar. Um, there's very, very uh, faint details on the abdomen of this guy that are a little bit different. He has more of a greenish stripe, um, but very, very faint differences. So this guy, um, you can hardly see, but that is one of our lake dwelling species. So again, that's one of the, the larger species. This one's called a traveling sedge. Um, found him the funniest way was just like paddle boarding with my family and saw this thing in the middle of a lake that kept like making an indent and I just I didn't think anything about it and then it kept getting closer and closer to me and it's this poor little caddis and he's got his little exoskeleton hanging on to him and he climbs up on my paddle board and emerges out but um, I had never seen those before actually in action but there's a reason that they're called the traveling sedge is because they always do this little walkabout on top of the water. Um, and so we, we as anglers have all these super complicated terms. And so if you've ever heard the term skittering, skitter your fly. If you ever have a guide or somebody say, skitter your fly, skitter your fly. That's what they're talking about is the caddis behavior. Um, because caddis, when they emerge out, will kind of skitter if they're stuck to their um, exoskeleton, much like those uh, emergers and cripples that we talked about, mayflies kind of getting hung up in their exoskeletons at the water surface. Um, sometimes caddis will get hung up as well, or they emerge out in the very middle of a body of water and they have to kind of Jesus cruise and run across the top of the water before they get to something where they can take off. Um, so I've always thought that was really cool. But these guys have Mondo cases. So if you can see, that's like bunches of sticks and bark and stuff that that's made out of. Um, these guys here are Limnophilid larvae. So these are those fall caddis. So again, just much bigger size. This case I personally really like. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a... It's a large October caddis case, but it's made out of smaller Mother's Day caddis cases. So it's cases on cases on cases. And then this one, um, something happened and it got calcified. That's uh, another challenge with caddis is that because of the fact that they have a home, they are more susceptible to disease than a lot of these other bugs because they can pass funguses and things like that to each other in colonies and stuff. So um, they are more susceptible when algaes and things like that bloom in certain areas. Um, but yeah, I don't know, for some reason this guy's little case calcified, but that's another one of our um, October caddis species or fall caddis species. And then again, just to show you that size disparity here, um, this guy is the free-living caddis, the racophility. So um, remember in the picture how green it was? This one's only been dead for like 48 hours and it's already brown and cream colored. So again, you're not getting a full accurate representation when you see pictures or pickled bugs about what the actual thing looks like. Um, so I'm just going to show you guys a couple flies here. 
tried to keep this super organized, but we'll see. Um, so when you're fishing these caddis as nymphs, see, this is better. You can actually see the bug if I can figure out where to put it. There. Um, so when you're fishing a caddis as a nymph, a lot of times you're going to have a bead head if you're fishing it as its true, true nymphal larval stage. So we're not fishing the pupa, we're not fishing the adult coming back up or down. Um, this is just fishing that true, true larval stage. Um, bead heads come in a variety of colors and wraps, um, lots of green, like I said, and cream color. But you'll notice one thing over and over again with caddis patterns, and I didn't read into this when I first started fly fishing, but caddis patterns are always really sparkly. Um, and the reason for that is because of those oxygen bubbles being trapped around their cases and things. A lot of times they'll give off this shiny reflection. So um, when you see this kind of tinsel and flash and sparkle and stuff, um, and kind of that messy looking tie, that is definitely a caddis imitation because um, it's imitating those oxygen bubbles and possibly, you know, um, different things developing within the case. Um, I mentioned that soft tackles were another really popular way to fish caddis. So there's an example of a soft tackle. And unique part about a soft tackle is that it's going to be unweighted, right? And it's going to have lots and lots of these like filamentous feathers around the top. And those are going to imitate a couple of things. Um, when that ferrate pupa adult is swimming to the surface, caddis are super leggy. So I don't know if you noticed that in that straw uh, fall color caddis I show you, but there's broken legs all in the container. Um, but they're super duper leggy and they can use their legs helping to kind of swim up to the surface. So these soft tackles um, imitate that very well. And when we fish soft tackles, um, we're not always super concerned about you know, throwing a mend or getting the perfect drift, right? Because when you're imitating an adult, you're trying to get this certain drift on top of the water. So we usually throw a mend in our line to give it a little bit of slack so it's not pulling unnaturally against the current. But with soft tackles, what you do is you want to cast across the stream and then kind of follow your rod tip downstream and then you kind of let that pull against the current and that kind of mimics what a caddis would look like if it was swimming up to the to the surface because it's not going to be floating perfectly it's going to be kind of fighting against the current right if it's swimming upwards so that's kind of the whole idea there behind fishing soft tackles um Maybe so again, we have a quick question yeah um, is a frenchie usually a caddis nymph Im imitation a frenchie is it's a type of jig nymph it could be a caddis it could be a mayfly it's more of a um more of an attractor pattern, but it definitely, that jig um, type of, of fly that's become more and more popular, I think does a great job of imitating caddis too with the way that they float with the hook upright. Um, on that note too, uh, jigs are way better to fish for that reason because a lot of frustration with caddis and anglers oftentimes comes from fishing down hook nymphs and them getting stuck in caddis cases from caddis that have just emerged. I don't know if you've ever pulled up your fly line and looked at your hook and there's a whole caddis case just nicely nestled on your hook, but that happens a lot after a big emergence and there's a lot of empty shucks on the bottom. Um, but a Frenchy jig could totally be something that, that I would use for a caddis imitation. Um, so those guys, that, there was kind of a brownish colored one and a green one. Again, not a huge variation because there's not a ton of variation in these actual bugs. Um, if I was going to fish a caddis emerger pattern, um, you've probably seen these like humpback or loop wing patterns. Again, very delicate with CDC, um, but he's kind of got a loop of material in the back right here. And it's just going to just basically gets stuck in kind of the surface tension of the water. It's not dense enough to sink, but it's CDC, so it's going to kind of float, and so it kind of just hangs there, and, and it looks like a caddis about to burst through the surface. So that's something that you can fish. Um, again, after uh, fishing with my caddis buddy Larry last year, I'm a firm believer in his little downwing caddis nymph idea that that's just a stage of life that's often missed and not fished properly. Um, 
another imitation of those legs in the adult. If you ever see a nymph that looks like that with the little feathery tails coming off the back, that's also to imitate those legs and that cat is swimming up. Um, so we mentioned with mayflies, you know, there's like the holy grail of flies that you need to know for each species or for each large group of aquatic insects. And so for mayflies, it's going to be your parachute atoms. For stoneflies, it's going to be your Chernobyl, your chubby. And then this guy is the elk hair caddis, which is kind of the all-time fly for caddis. And sorry, he's not laying really pretty. Um, but super basic tie, just a light dubbing body, a little bit of copper wrap around the body, and then um, just basic elk hair. And these come in a variety of colors. Um, I'll fish these for caddis pretty much every time I need a caddis pattern. Um, I'll go for green ones earlier in the year and bigger ones and brown ones later in the year, but that is the most consistent pattern. And if you're gonna have one caddis pattern in your box, it should be that one. Um, again, that was kind of more of a brown color. This is a more traditional white with the tan body, that same thing. Again, super basic tie, so it's really easy if you want to do at home. Um, I like this particular pattern. Um, oh, I cannot do this. This is called a Schroeder's. And it's got like a little bit of a rolled turkey wing there. And it looks really, really real on the water. It provides that kind of that A-frame shape. It captures that and makes a nice little shadow on the water. Um, and then you can see it really well with the parachute. Um, again, elk hair caddis comes in black. We get little black caddis that emerge out here in August. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what family they're in because I don't know what family they're in. <laughs> um, they're little black caddis. So match your size. And that is probably your, your first thing to do. And then the behavior would be the second. Um, this is a riff on an elk hair caddis, but I had pretty good luck on this guy last year and thought he was a really good fly to use. Um, so that was... But it's another elk hair with some CDC underneath. Again, that CDC kind of imitates you know, them coming out of the pupa or maybe some exoskeleton that might be hanging around. Um, it just brings a lot of attention to the top of the water. There is one caddis that's common name is the longhorn caddis, so you'll never guess what this fly imitates. Um, it's in family Leptoceridae, and again, that's one of the ones, once you get to know it, when you see this, you'll know it's a longhorn caddis because there's no other caddis with antenna three times the length of their body. Um, this particular fly pattern is called a Goddard's caddis, and it is the main one that you would use to imitate longhorn caddis. Um, we get a pretty big longhorn caddis hatch on Henry's Fork at the beginning of the year. And then just to kind of go back to talking about um, match the hatch versus uh, an attractor pattern, this is an example of what an attractor pattern might look like. You can't really see the color very well, but he has a purple body. Um, again, just kind of a grab your attention to the fish, and it's got roof-like wings over the body there. So um, if there's a big hatch going on, maybe fishing a little bitty gray bug is not gonna do you much good because the fish isn't gonna know the difference between your bug and what the real ones are on the water. But sometimes in situations like that, throwing out a, more of an attractor pattern with a flashy color to grab their attention a little bit more might be more productive. Um, but caddis, really, in all honesty, with when it comes to flies, they're not super complicated. Like I said, if you have a variety of elk hair caddis and um, some different colors and sizes in your box, and then maybe have a couple of loop wings and soft tackles, and then a few just basic like green and cream colored bead head nymphs, you should have everything covered. Um, but that is uh, kind of it that I've got on caddis flies. So if you guys have any questions. Well, let me know. All right. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Keep uh, keep an eye on our social. Um, Maggie and I are talking about what's next for Bugs with Mags. Um, Maybe a new series, What's on My Finger. <laughs> <laughs> it's a drinking game. It'll be fun. <laughs>
All right, everybody, have a wonderful night. Thank you, guys. Y'all have a good one.